Hey everybody, CVH here, and today we're going to be back to discussing some card acquisition in Elder Scrolls Legends. The Essential Legendary video that I posted a couple days ago was really well received, so thank you guys very much for checking it out, leaving likes, and letting me know that you found it informative and interesting, and hopefully we can continue that trend today. As you can see on screen, we've used the handy filter here in the Collection Manager to bring up Epics, uh, also known as the second most expensive type of card, the rarity, in Elder Scrolls Legends, and there are a ton of epics in this game. So what I'll be doing is basically the same format as I did for the Legendary video, where we'll go through color by color, attribute by attribute, and discussing which of these are the craziest, the most ubiquitous, that you see all the time in high tier decks in Legends, that you would benefit the most from creating or trying to get your hands on in some way. Uh, and this will hopefully give you, if you are able to attain most, if not all, of the cards on this list, uh, the, the best chance at building a well-rounded array of really good decks in Legends. You'll hopefully be prepared to build a lot of things. Uh, so a lot of the cards we'll mention are staple or close to it in these colors, at least in certain styles of decks. And I'll obviously mention the decks that they're particularly good in as we move through the epics. And there are a lot of epics that are somewhat playable that you see in some decks, but not others. And I think it would be informative to to go through and just sort of mention all the epics. After I talk about the, the one to three or four in each color attribute that are really, really, really just you know, over-the-top good that you really should look at getting first. Uh, I, I'll be going through briefly and discussing each of these, and I think that'll make the video kind of long. So what I'll be doing is going through the first three colors in this video, and in part two we'll be discussing the uh, the last two colors, the multicolor cards, and the neutral cards. So hopefully you guys bear with me through both parts, and we're going to start this off right now with strength as we did in the last one. And there are a couple cards and strengths, a couple epics, that you really want to look at. The first of which is Earthbone Spinner. Now this was actually, if I remember correctly, one of the first epics that I made premium. Uh, which is ironic because I did actually get rid of a premium copy like 10 months ago when I was first building my collection. And I didn't know if I was going to care about premiums. I did know Earthbone Spinner was good, but as soon as I got three regular copies. But that was a regret. That was definitely a regret. Because Earthbone Spinner is a card that is in virtually every single strength deck, and for good reason. Uh, you can't really say enough about the uh, the versatility of Earthbone Spinner. Uh, we've talked before about how good Silence is when we've discussed other cards in the game. And the fact that it's attached to a reasonably costed body means you can play it in both faster strength decks, slower strength decks, and you're getting that one damage ping. And sometimes you just play Earthbone Spinner on like a 3-1 or something with no effect that you don't need to silence, and it'll just take care of it, and you can use it as a, as a glorified sharpshooter scout, basically, and that's often fine. Uh, the real glory of this card, though, is being able to one-shot maybe like a buffed wardcrafter or a gardener of swords. This card is the bane of those cards' existence when people attach too many items to something. Not only are you getting that silence effect, but sometimes you just outright kill it with Earthbone Spinner. And uh, that's often a swing that's too hard to come back from. Uh, one can debate the... I don't know, the... Uh, the the, the real affordability of silence in this game, I guess. Uh, this is a card that you don't really get punished for not having a really good target, and it's so insane when you do that. You virtually see it in every single strength deck. Uh, so that aside, I do think this card is going to be around for a very, very long time as a 3 of in tons of different decks. Totally recommend you picking it up as a result. Moving on, nothing else on the first page really screams crazy. Uh, the second card, and yeah, possibly the last that we'll be talking about for crazy good epics that you should be picking up fast, is Belligerent Giant. And, you know, much like Earthbone Spinner, you'll notice this is a running trend with some of the cards we're discussing here. This is another card that's often complained about. This card is a huge tempo swing. So on summon, you're going to be unsummoning an enemy creature. So, for example, we discussed this a bit with Nahagleave in the Legendary video. Uh, they're paying 7 for a 7-7 seven, seven guard, which is a pretty good effect, too. You know, it's a pretty good investment of 7. You're paying 7 to negate their investment of 7. All of a sudden, you have a 7-4, they have nothing... And that's going to be horrible for them, especially if you are the aggressor. You normally see Belligerent Giant uh, in those more aggressive mid-range, uh, you know, red decks, uh, such as Archer or maybe Crusader. You've seen them in a lot of lists on this channel if you've been checking them out. And just because you're pushing the aggression so much until turn 7 and your opponent's trying to stick some big guard or something that can help them trade, or maybe setting up for an unstoppable rage play, any any amount of things uh, that relates to them playing one creature on the board, Belligerent Giant is perfect against and is often that final nail in the coffin when you're just pushing your opponent out of the game turn by turn. And to say nothing of it, seven attack value. Obviously, they're already dealing, they're already trying to contend with your board, that is. You drop the giant, all of a sudden they're out of an option to do that with, and you have a seven attack body. And it has breakthrough. 
And maybe you don't have a good target on board, but if they have a support, maybe they're playing a wacky spider lair deck, maybe they've jammed a Mundestone or Divine Fervor or something, uh, well, if there's nothing to bounce, you can just, you know, take your tempo elsewhere, so to speak, and just kill their support. This card has seen uh, some fluctuation in play over the months, but recently it's been coming back into the, the limelight, and uh, it's just proven to be such a crazy card in these decks. And you see it in a lot of slow decks, too, just because the card pool is still rather small, uh, and it's a fine control card, honestly. It's going to help you trade with some things later, uh, and it's spot removal. It's getting threats off the board. Really, really powerful red card that I definitely encourage you guys to look at getting as soon as possible. And I guess we should talk about one more card here, Markarth Bannerman. This card sees play in a lot of token-centric decks. Merrick Battle Mage, it is 100% required, so I will be mentioning it here. It's one of the ones that, if you're trying to play a deck that focuses around token synergy like Divine Fervor or, uh, or Merrick Battle Mage, this card is, like, very, very unique. You can't really replicate its effect with anything. Raiding Party comes the closest, but this card has insane value if it sticks for a turn. Is also punching just a really good 5-drop. Takes the place of Blood Dragon in a lot of those decks that really care about the Nord Firebrand tokens. Uh, besides that, let's go through and discuss the epics that I didn't mention. Some of them are really close to being on that list of the ones that I think are the most insane, but not quite there, and we'll talk about why. Mage Slayer, a fine aggressive card. Um, I wouldn't really say outclassed because its effect is really useful. You just don't see this card too often in Constructed because uh, this is other better 2-drop 3-2s. It's a Nord, so it doesn't really have any synergy at the moment. Orc decks would rather play Orcs. Other aggressive decks would rather even play the 2-drop 3-2 Prophecies like Lurking Crocodile uh, or you know Greystone Ravager is a 4-1, those kind of cards. So you just don't see this card too much unless you're playing an aggressive deck specifically designed to counter a deck like Mage. Not getting Firebolted and not being affected by Ice Storm is pretty big, not gonna lie. It's just often not quite worth it in these decks. So I'd give this card like a C. I'll try to rate these cards on a, like an A through E. I suppose that's the best way to do it. Plunder, I would give a D or an E. Uh, it looks like a decent card on paper, but besides being sometimes swingy in Arena, uh, it's just too inconsistent, too reliant on RNG, and too much of a tempo loss for an aggressive deck to be playing that and not knowing what you're going to get out of it. Blighted a lit, I'll give another C. Almost sees no play. The one time you might see this card is in an aggro battle mage deck. Uh, which I have played it in mine, and it was fairly good. I don't play it all the time in that deck, but being able to damage yourself can turn into a benefit if you're playing a bunch of prophecies or need the card draw. But it has a high attack value. Sometimes it's a liability in an aggro mirror is when you don't know if you want to be damaging yourself, and its health value is relatively low. Fearless Northlander, I'll give like a B- minus here. It's okay. Again, it competes with the three drop slot. Well, it competes with a lot of other things for the three drop slot. You can see this card sometimes in some Crusader lists uh, if they're playing more of a control oriented game. Uh, the low attack value at start is kind of annoying for the deck, but if you're playing like a mid ranger control deck, uh, you can use this to trade really effectively early game. And if you're playing cards like Skaven Pyromancer and Rapid Shot, they can allow you both removal and ways to buff this up effectively. You just don't see the card a lot because there's a lot of really good three drops out there. That's basically the reason. Uh, Withered Hand Cultist, while I don't suggest you rush to pick it up, it is probably the best card we've mentioned so far outside of the, the regular list. I'll give this card a solid B. A uh, really, really powerful effect that can lock a lot of decks out of the game. Um, if you're playing in a meta with a lot of control decks, a lot of Merrick Battle Mage, a lot of Control Mage, a lot of, you know, maybe Control Monk, this card is a huge annoyance for those decks. So if you're finding yourself playing a red deck, um, this would be like a perfect sideboard card, for example. If you're finding yourself playing a deck with strength that's focusing on aggression, but you're getting locked out of the game by a lot of these control decks, uh, moving to a less action-heavy approach with maybe zero or three actions in the deck and focusing on Mage Slayers and Withered Hand Cultist, Cultist specifically, uh, is going to be a real problem card for those control decks. So this is this is a, definitely a tech choice, uh, which is why I didn't mention it in the first list, uh, and it does fight for another, you know, all, again, all the three drops that are in the game. This is not necessarily the strongest by itself, but in the right situation, uh, given the right metagame call, Withered Hand Cultist is really crazy. So this is a card that you should pick up just in case you run into a metagame where there's a lot of spells action-heavy decks, I mean, and uh, you are trying to play a red deck in that, that is going to be your main tech choice against them. Alakir Survivalist, not seeing any play at all. I'm going to give this card like a D or an E. In theory, it's good in an item synergy deck, but in other theory, it's just not good enough, period. And currently, those decks aren't very good. Uh, you may see this card in some meme decks, not really anything else besides that. Spinner, we've talked about, is crazy. Gladiator Arena used to be crazy at a 3. At a 4, it doesn't even see much play in the aggro battle mage list still. It's okay. Uh, if you're playing those decks, it's not even required, though. I'm going to give it, like, a C-. minus. You just don't need the card anymore if you're going to play Aggro Battle Mage. And in any other deck, it's just horrible. So, moving on to Ogrim. This is another B. Uh, this is going to be almost on the list of 
like really crazy essential epics. Uh, so Ogrim, I mean, it competes in the 4-drop slot and it's weak to Lightning Bolt. Uh, it works really well in a deck with Withered Hand Cultist because that Cultist is going to deny the main answers to Ogrim, which are, you know, Lightning Bolt, Piercing Javelin, Edict of Azura. And this is a card that should be answered immediately or it's going to punch for a ton of damage. Uh, it, it's fine in mid-range decks. A lot of the time you're just playing, you know, more well-rounded 4-drops. Uh, but you will see this card occasionally if you can look back. There are some decks that really focus on just raw power strength cards, and Ogrim has some of the most raw power you could expect a 4-drop to ever have. The issue is its low health, obviously, and the fact that it can't gain cover. So this is another card that exacerbates the problem that some decks might have of if it loses the board, it's really hard to get the board back, because you can't even stick this card in the shadow lane and protect it for a turn and then try to get that 7 damage in. To say nothing of the actions that could kill it, or the shackles that could happen to it, it just doesn't gain cover ever, which, is, which can be a significant problem for the card. But it's still really good. It's still better than uh, virtually everything we've mentioned, uh, except for like maybe Cultist and Earthbone Spinner on this page, for example. Trebuchet, uh, it's getting an E from me in Constructed. It just doesn't see any play whatsoever besides the meme deck, uh, so you don't need to worry about this card at all. Burn and Pillage in its previous six Magicka form that affected both lanes was one of the best cards in the game. Um, maybe just the best red card in the game at that point, but that was nerfed a long time ago. As it is, you don't need it for any deck. It's it's a fine card. You could see it seeing some play in some aggressive red decks, but it, it, you just really don't see it too much anymore in high tier decks. It's fine. It's really good in Arena still, if that counts for anything. I'm uh, going to give this card like another C- Minus. Gratwood Ambusher is pretty reasonable. I'm going to say this card gets a C. Uh, I give a C. Like, we're talking about the C's, basically. We've already talked about the A tier and some of the, beer the B tier, not the beer tier. Uh, the Gratwood Ambusher mostly only really seen in the Prophecy Aggro Battle Mage deck, and that's really to counter the other aggressive decks. This card is obviously not great from your hand. 5-drop 4-2, even with that effect, it's unlikely the effect is going to help you pay for the fact that you're playing a 4-2 on turn 5, but as a Prophecy, this card is one of the swingiest things in certain matchups, so you will see it in the Prophecy Aggro Battle Mage deck. You will likely not see it anywhere else, because for this kind of effect, you'd rather just play Skaven Pyromancer or Ice Storm or whatever else the deck you're playing has access to. Mark Arth we talked about is great. Uh, I will skip to Dread Clan Fear really quick just to tell you that it's not good. It sees almost no play. I'm going to give it an E. Not going all the way down to F here, but if we were going all the way down to F, it would probably get an F. Uh, meme card. Child of Hercene and Stampede Sentinel I do want to discuss a bit together. Both of these cards kind of fit the same role for certain decks, and that role has basically turned into, if it doesn't get easily removed with a Leaf Lurker or Belligerent Giant or gets shackled by, you know, one of the more efficient cards in the game, uh, it's basically setting up for um, Unstoppable Rage. So we have to basically judge these with Unstoppable Rage. In an Unstoppable Rage-centric deck, they're fine. Child of Hercene can also be a little bit better not in an Unstoppable Rage deck because you can attach Snake Tooth Necklace or something like that to it and focus on getting value that way through repeated drains or something like that. Overall, these cards are going to be seen mostly in decks that want to take advantage of Unstoppable Rage, which is another B-tier epic, I would say. Whirling Duelist, almost sees no play, going to give it another, I'll give it like a, is an E-plus a thing? I'm going to say D-minus here. You see it occasionally with Daedric Dagger, because you can equip Daedric Dagger, give it lethal, and it deals a lot of damage, and, you know, it has lethal, so it kills things. But that's, while impressive that you've gotten that combo off, it's usually not efficient. Uh, it's just not the best way you have to clearing the board in virtually any deck, I would say. So you really don't see this card in any high-tier deck. Uh, if you're playing a low-tier deck based around that kind of combo, you probably yeah, you probably should pick it up, but yeah, that deck is not very good, I would say. So just probably avoid Whirling Duelist. Wouldn't go out of your way to craft it. Giant, we've talked about the last two cards are the seven cost cards, Unstoppable Rage and Rothgar Forge. Uh, Rothgar Forge, there are decks based around it, it, they're not like particularly good. They're not high tier, I would say. They probably never will be, just because of all the good support removal that's out there and the slowness of the card, even against any aggressive deck. Uh, it takes a lot to really encourage you to play this card. And again, even if you get the train rolling with Forge, it does uh, have a lot of reliance in RNG because you're equipping things with random items. So just not a card you should really worry about getting if you're just starting your collection. Unstoppable Rage, however, does come from the Fall of the Dark Brotherhood, so you don't need to worry about crafting. Uh, if you pick up that collection, you will be getting all the Dark Brotherhood cards along with it when you play through the story mode. And Rage is really, really good. I didn't mention it on the the highest tier of legendary, uh, highest tier of epics, uh, because while it is really good, it doesn't see as much continuous play as cards like Earthbone Spinner and Belligerent Giant. And for good reason, this card does require a setup. But when you get a good Unstoppable Rage off, the power level of the card can easily reach. 
uh, the ceiling of the, the card, I mean, like, then the max power level you could get from it. The ceiling of this card is easily as high as a card like Earthbone Spinner or Belligerent Giant. Uh, obviously, we've seen highlights on this channel, and, you know, you watch streams, you see this card kill an entire lane, drain for 20 or 30 points, hit your opponent for 20 or 30 points through breakthrough damage, all at the same time, frequently given the right situation, given the right combination of cards. The issue is that it does require a setup, and it kind of requires a deck that is tailored to the card. You will be running cards, like I mentioned such as Child of Hercene or Stampede Sentinel to get max value. So it's not a card that fits in every red deck. It's definitely too slow for most aggro decks. And even in the mid-range decks, you will have to find uh, cards that you play that benefit really heavily from Rage that aren't as good as other cards by themselves. And obviously Rage by itself is not great. So if you want to play this card, it does sort of require its own style. Uh, there are decks out there that can take good advantage of it, but I wouldn't initially worry about crafting this card just to have a card that's good in most red decks you'll play, unless you really just love the card that much. Obviously, if this gets nerfed ever and it, you know, changes, which is maybe, it's one of the most complained about cards, so I wouldn't necessarily count on this card staying the same forever. If you're watching this video in the future and this card's different than it is currently in front of you, uh, yeah, don't be too surprised it is kind of complained about, but if it ever doesn't work with Drain or Breakthrough or costs more, it likely will not be even worth considering to the point that I am right now. But that's it for the red cards. As I mentioned, Earthbone, Spinner, Belligerent, Giant, and Markarth Bannerman to a lesser extent are probably the three that you really, really want to check out as soon as possible. Moving on to Intelligence. Intelligence is going to be fun because, <laughs> well, I don't know if fun is the exact right word for that, but there are a lot of really bad epics in Intelligence. So more often than not, when you're pulling an epic and it's blue, you're going to be disappointed. Sucks to say, that's probably just the truth, though. Uh, a couple of them have been nerfed in the past, which we can discuss when we get into the lower tier. But to start, uh, the legendary, the, excuse me, the epics that you really, really want, uh, I can only really think, there, there's three that I'll talk about here, and uh, only one of them is like, on its own A plus tier, and that is Ice Storm. Ice Storm I mentioned in the uh, the top 10 crafting guides when I did those, and it's retained its power level for all these months. It's just probably the best, most consistent board clear in the game, dealing three damage to all creatures. It's a simple card, it's an elegant card, and it is a required card for any blue deck that wants to be going into the mid or late stages of the game and not dying. Merrick Battle Mage runs three of these all the time, Control Mage runs three of these all the time, you get the idea, right? Any any slower Sorcerer deck would probably play it as well. Any control-oriented deck is going to want this card because it is one of the best ways to keep the board under control in the game. Uh, I don't think I need to go too much in depth about this card. If you're playing a really aggro deck, you really don't want this card in like aggro Battle Mage, but you will even see some aggressive decks tech this card in as a potential reset button. If you lose the board, this is a way to get it back. Some decks can't game the board back. Decks with Ice Storm can typically get the board back. So you will see it as a one of in certain decks, but basically any slow deck, period, is going to be playing three of these. So pick this card up if you have any inclination to play Control Mage especially, and any deck similar to it. The other two I'm going to talk about, uh, well, Master of Arms is right here, so we'll discuss that. 100% required for any item synergy deck, because you're recycling Tome of Alteration, and that's the reason you do it. Not required for anything else. Don't worry about this card if you're not going to play those decks, but I do want to mention it because it's one of those cards that is 100% required for a very specific type of deck. Kind of similar to that is Breton Conjurer. This is a very synergy dependent card. It's really powerful with cards like Rapid Shot, as you notice in the Merrick Battle Mage deck. Um, so certain decks will definitely be able to take advantage of this effect, and certain decks will not. And in the decks that can't take advantage of this effect, you really don't want to play it, because this card is super weak to cards like Curse and Execute, and basically getting a 0 or 1 cost card to kill a 4 cost card that they've wasted their entire turn 4 on, that's game winning a lot of times, because tempo is a huge part of the game, and that's a huge tempo loss. So, in a deck that can support it, like Merrick Battle Mage, you really want this card, uh, in the average deck with blue, it might be more powerful if you're just looking for like replacements, like you've pulled a Breton Conjurer or something and you don't have every card you need for the mid-range Sorcerer deck. Sure, go ahead and play Breton. Uh, it's worth a meta call decision at least, because certain classes like Sorcerer can't deal with it a whole lot. But uh, you don't really just want to play this card raw on a deck that can't proc its own ability too effectively. Uh, but in those decks, you really do want it. I am including it just because, you know, like Master of Arms, even though you only want to play this card in certain decks, the power level of it is so high in the right deck that you should look to getting it anyway. And it has a pretty sick premium, right? I really like the way this looks, so had to show off my set of premium Breton Conjures. So now, now that we've mentioned Breton, Ice Storm, and Master of Arms, we can talk about the, the B to E tiers, I guess, of the epics in blue. 
hopefully you guys let, enjoy uh, me going through like this. If you do, always, as always, if you enjoy the content, leave a comment. And let me know what you think about the presentation. Blood Sorceress came out of the Bar Dark Brotherhood better than I expected. I expected it to be trash. It's less than trash in certain, you know, aggro decks. You can get away with it as a one drop. Uh, it's also okay with with Smother in certain decks. I'll give it a C. It's not amazing. It's definitely not trash tier. You don't need it for any deck, however. You just the, the, there's no combo deck with Wisp Mother and Blood Sorceress because it's that inefficient, that inconsistent. However, it's a reasonable card in some aggro decks. It might even be right in some decks, uh, but it's not something you need to rush to get. Balmoris Spy Master, pure meme card, uh, not required in any top tier deck. Going to give it a D for playability, but it can be really, really wacky. And if you're going to play a Necrom Mastermind Last Gasp deck, you really want this card. But that deck, like I mentioned with Necrom itself, it's not very good, and neither is a Spy Master. Moment of Clarity. Pretty much trashed here. Gonna be honest, you just don't need this effect. There are a ton of bad cards. This could come from any class. Uh, sometimes you walk out and get a sick card, but that's not worth including Moment of Clarity. You'd rather just include a better card. Given it an E, not very good at all. Shimmerine Peddler is probably an E in certain decks, but in the right deck, it's really, really powerful. In the Stealer of Secrets OTK with all those actions, it's really good. In certain Control Mage lists, it's really good. In certain Merrick Battle Mage lists that are trying to combat control by getting extra value out of the cards, it's really good. Weak Body by yourself, but this is going to get a B from me. I don't think you need to rush out to craft it, but like Breton Conjure, if you want to play Merrick Battle Mage, while this card isn't as required as Breton, there are versions that don't play Shimmerine Peddler. It is a very powerful effect. Just drawing a free card is very powerful. And if you're playing a deck, maybe Control Mage with Firebolts, Executes, and Healing Potions, or obviously Merrick Battle Mage with Lesser Wards, Rapid Shots, and Firebolts, any deck like that, or like I mentioned, the Stealer of Secrets OTK, which is kind of a, a weird example because it's not super good, but really shows an example of a deck that won Shimmerine Peddler a lot. Wisdom of Ancients, like Moment of Clarity, just not consistent enough. Sometimes you luck out and it's really good, but it's not worth including it in your deck for those fringe cases. So, gonna give that one another E. Brilliant Experiment. So, this is interesting. It is good in some Control Mage lists. Uh, the really slow ones that want to win just through sheer value and not really run finishers like Atromancer. Sometimes you can play Atromancer and Experiment too. This card was really nuts when it cost 2. Uh, it was nerfed, like Dark Rift we'll talk about as well, this was also nerfed from 2 to 3 Magicka. Uh, because you can loop Iron with it, you can just make sure in a Control Mirror match that you don't have any other actions in your discard pile. You play an Iron to get back like the one action you have. You play Brilliant Experiment on the Iron, the Iron gets to the discard pile, it will, then you have the Brilliant Experiment on the... They have the Iron on the board, you play the Brilliant Experiment that goes to the discard pile. And then you can just sort of play infinite irons even if they get rid of the one on the board as long as you continuously have one in your hand. The experiment starts costing zero and you start just doing insane things to your opponent. But outside of that exact situation, well, not out, because you can also duplicate heals with this card. It's interesting because it's really good in Control Mage, has a lot of versatility in Control Mage, uh, but you really don't want this card in too many other decks at all. Uh, you also don't really need this card in Control Mage. Certain versions, like I said, want to play it. Some just want to have more consistent cards. It goes in and out, but it is a fine card in Control Mage. You can play around with it if you want. Some versions even run three, some just tackle one of. It's, it's a fine card, but outside of Control Mage, not really worth picking up, period. Dark Rift used to be crazy at two, and since it got nerfed to three, I have seen it zero times on the ladder. So that's pretty much all I need to talk about. The, the, the difference between ringing this out on turn one and playing it on turn three raw sometimes is just tremendous and it's just not worth it as it is. It also gets, it's just incredibly weak as it always has been to some support removal. Not worth picking up really. Still okay in Arena, however. Uh, Desperate Conjuring is interesting. Certain cards like Dark Harvester work really well with the Conjuring. Certain cards do not. Most cards do not. It's also very inefficient. Like most of the RNG cards in this game are well designed to the point where more often than not, they're not gonna be worth it. Don't worry about picking this card up. It's more or less a meme card. Keeper of Whispers is actually kind of fine. I'd give it like a C for overall value, but you just don't see this card. It's not on the high end of three drops. There's Daggerfall Mage and Cunning Ally, so you really don't need Keeper of Whispers for anything. As you can see, I apparently only have two copies of it. I have no idea how that actually happened after the hundreds and hundreds of packs that I've opened, but to be fair, you'd never really need a whole set in anything. Yeah, I actually have no idea why I only have two copies of that. That's really crazy to me. Well, oh well. Uh, there are a couple that I know I've gotten rid of before. Ice Wraith, horrible card, seen in no constructed decks, period. Given in the Dragon Star Rider, also gets, well, a D minus. I'll give it a D minus because Corsair Ship came out and it's somewhat reasonable with Corsair Ship, but that's it's not good. It's just not a good card. Winner's Grasp, I have seen this card in a couple constructed decks, and when I say a couple, I literally mean like two. 
I uh, wouldn't worry about picking it up. In, in certain decks, you can maybe try to tech one into race your opponent, but it's not a card that is traditionally seen in any high-tier decks. We're giving it a D, but it's it's a really cute card, right? Because if you're racing, shut down your opponent's entire board for a turn and continue racing. Battle Reef of Dusk, uh, it gets another E. It's just not good. Tried it when it came out. It wasn't good. Never, ever really worth it. And even if it is worth it, there are better cards once you get to turn 6+. plus. Heirloom Greatsword is kind of funky as a one-of in some item decks. Besides that, you don't really see it a whole lot. It's actually pretty slow for aggro decks. Uh, but in some item decks, you could maybe tech it in as a one-of and, and duplicate it with Gardener of Swords, and that can be really obnoxious. But besides that, you don't need the card. I already talked about Ice Storm and Master of Arms. Studium Headmaster is the kind of card that looks like it could potentially good, could potentially be good in an aggro deck. But even in those decks, there are better ways to keep your hand, and this card is super fragile. It's the bad blue Triumphant Yarl, basically. And no, there are really no mill decks that you would want to use this effect in. Up next, we have another pair of pretty bad cards, Somerset Ori and Mage's Guild Retreat. Uh, they seem to be in competition for, with each other for worst support card in the game. I think Mage's Guild Retreat uh, is the second worst support card in this page, at least. Uh, it's just really, really slow. The effect is not worth it. There are way better ways to get power on the board. Uh, it's like the Shimmering Peddler, except it costs an absurd amount for the effect you're getting, and it doesn't apply any pressure to the board, and you're paying 7 for it. Uh, it's just incredibly unlikely you ever want to play this card, and getting Shadow and Priest loses you the game immediately. Uh, unless you're already in such a winning position that you could literally play any card and not lose. Somerset Ori, somehow a bigger waste of Magicka. Uh, you never, ever, ever want to play this card. I'm fairly certain this is the absolute worst card in the game. I would rather play unupgraded cards from the story mode than Somerset Ori in my deck. It's just never, ever worth it. Never worth it. It is also, I think, the only card that I have never picked in Arena. Which is... Pretty astounding. So Wismother, uh, yeah, Wismother is actually good. Um, it's it's good in certain combo decks. Uh, people have duplicated Relentless Raider. I mentioned Blood Sorcerer. I think people try, uh, and it's good in certain decks. And you can also duplicate the zero cost elusive schemers. These guild recruit. There are actually a lot of good targets for this card. Uh, the issue is that it's sometimes slow and inconsistent. But in a value oriented deck, like I really like this in the value assassin deck, and I maintain my stance that that deck is pretty good. Uh, Wismother is just not a card that you need in anything. Uh, there are no real Wismother combo decks where this card is required, but in, in a certain deck you can make this card work. It's it's more of a meme sort of synergy dependent card than the others, but it, it's a pretty good card. I'll give this card a C. And we move on to the final color that we're talking about for this video, which is Yellow Willpower. For starters, let's see what the, the absolute best yellow cards are. I'll be talking about Manticore first, I think. There are a couple I'll briefly mention as really good but Manticora is the best. Manticora is kind of the reason control decks exist in Legends, and that might seem like an overstatement, but this is basically the perfect control card. Uh, it used to be able to target creatures in any lane, so you could plop Manticora down without limits. But now you have to play it in the same lane. People worry that this card would be bad after that. No, this card is absolutely insane still. It has guard, it's spot removal, it has a reasonable body. You're killing things while being defensive, while giving yourself a body that you could push with. So it's basically the Swiss Army Knife for control decks. Really, really powerful card. You'll see every single, I don't even want to say basically, you'll see every single control deck that's using yellow playing three of these, and that has been the case for the last 10 months straight, so if you have any inclination to playing Control Mage, Control Spell Sword, any of those slow yellow decks, Control Crusader, just any control deck with yellow, you really want and need three Manticores, it is the one of the major cards you play around against control decks, because every control deck plays it, because it's so good. So pick up Manticore if you want to play those kinds of decks, there is literally no reason not to play that card in a three of. The next couple cards we'll be talking about are a a little bit less ubiquitous. I don't think there's anything on the first page I really need to talk about. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking about them, you know, going, you know, through and through. Uh, the other two cards are gonna be Cloudrest Illusionist, which is a really powerful card that you see, and I think even the majority of yellow decks right now, I don't know, it's, it's kind of close. It's a really good prophecy. It's one of the largest bodies you can get off of a prophecy creature, which by itself is okay early game against aggro. Often playing a 4-3 for free off of the first rune that's going to sometimes stop damage, but then be able to double trade is better than getting a Piercing Javelin or something early, depending on the board state, obviously. But the effect can be used with Execute as well. Uh, you don't see this in every single Willpower deck, obviously, but a lot of them take advantage of this effect with Execute, and that's an incredibly powerful combination, because both cards, unlike some other combos in the game, both cards are actually very good by themselves, and this card in aggressive decks can even help you trade through a guard, uh, so you're not really trading favorably, but... 
you know, with Cloud Rest Illusionist, you can reduce the damage significantly that happens on your creatures and maybe keep everything alive, which is pretty sick. So Cloud Rest Illusionist is a card that it goes in and out of basically every style of willpower deck. It's not required in any of them, but it is a really, really good, well-rounded card. So definitely wouldn't hurt to have a set of those to maybe include in certain decks. I actually think, on second thought, those are the only ones I'll mention. I'll, I'll go through the others, obviously, like I have been doing, but for the, the highest tier of willpower uh, epics that you should really look to picking up, Manticore is probably first if you want to play any slower deck, and Cloud Rest for the versatility, and it's just being a generally really good card. So moving on, Blackmail. Meme card entirely. I play it in RNG Mage because it says random on it, and I play it in nothing else because the card is pretty trashy, uh, giving it an E for playability, but if you ever lose to this card, it's going to feel really, really bad. I promise you that because it's happened to me. Helgen Squad Leader, 2 cost 0, 3, and gets buffed when other things attack. This card has seen some play uh, in very, very aggressive token decks that go wide on the board and start attacking, and Helgen Squad Leader can get pretty impressive in those decks. The problem is that when you play it on curve, it's horrible, so it's kind of taking a 2-drop slot without actually being a 2-drop unless you started with a Scouting Patrol. Uh, it's a really weak card to execute, really weak card to silence. Uh, overall, probably not worth it in those decks. As the card pool expands, I expect this card to eventually just not see much play, period. So I wouldn't worry about this card at all. Uh, D. D minus, maybe. Ravenous Hunger. Okay, this is an interesting one. Uh, it's not a consistently good card. A lot of people will play this card because it looks really powerful, but then they'll realize the one health, even in this game, is still pretty bad. It's not like Hearthstone where things get pinged all the time because of the hero powers, so it's not quite that bad. Uh, but in the right deck, you can get a good amount of use out of this card, depending on if you're playing Unstoppable Rage, basically. I think that's the criteria for Hunger being good. I really wouldn't touch the card outside of Rage, but the idea with that is that you have a 2 cost 4 attack body, which is then going to get Drain, and then you can hung you can uh, Unstoppable Rage the Hunger against a lane of maybe 3 or 4 dudes with low health. Uh, for example, if your opponent just played a Supreme Atromancer and already had a 3-2 in that lane, uh, plop down Hunger Rage for 9 Magicka, and that's going to drain for 12 points and clear the board, which is pretty crazy. Outside of that combo, it can be reasonable sometimes to combat early aggression, but uh, without that combo in the deck, I wouldn't play the card because it's going to be answered more often than you'd like by Firebolt, Goblin Skulks, Curses, Scaven Pyromath, you get the idea. Anything that deals one damage answers hunger. Should be pretty obvious. Uh, our Tame Savant you see in the very, very rare action mage deck, and even then, it's not really great. Gonna give it a D minus. In theory, it's better than it is, but maybe one day there's a duck that really wants Savant. I just don't think that deck exists now. Dawnstar Healer gets a B for me. This is actually a very, very powerful card. Uh, the issue is not every deck wants this kind of heal. First of all, not every deck wants healing. Second of all, not every deck wants the kind of a criteria Dawnstar Healer gives you, which is you have to attack your opponent. There are more aggressive versions of Control Mage that, uh, after stabilizing on the board, will then start really pushing the offensive and use healer to gain you know, 6 to 12 points in a single turn, and that's really absurd. So in the deck like that you really want to get aggressive with at a certain point in the game, it Basically, Dawnstar Healer requires some some thought, some forethought on what your deck's game plan is. But you can see this card in a certain amount of mid-range decks, because in those decks you want to be able to race your other aggressive opponents. Uh, if your opponent's racing you in one lane, you're racing in the other lane, you drop down a Dawnstar Healer and start healing for like 12 points of damage in one turn, or at least 6. 6 to 9. Like, that's still good, because you're pushing so much damage, and you're gaining that much. It's like giving Drain to the lane, like a pre-nerf Pillaging Tribune, basically. The card is good in certain decks, not required for all decks. Uh, definitely not required for a deck that doesn't really want to get aggressive at all. I wouldn't play this card in a strict control deck, but if your game plan involves getting aggressive at a certain point, really powerful healing effect. I actually don't want to talk about Elsewhere Lookout because I've been under the impression that it's pretty awful. Uh, even for Pilfer decks, but I did actually lose to it on the ladder recently when it got Maple Shielded, and it turned into, no joke, it had like 56 health. It was insane. I just couldn't beat the- it was- I don't even want to talk about it. Overall, you want this card in zero decks that don't contain Thieves Den and Master of Thieves. Uh, basically, Pilfer decks want this card sometimes, uh, and even then, the fact that it's probably correct to play Maple Shield on the deck to keep Lookout from not dying immediately says a little bit about the card. <laughs> Uh, but given the exact right situation, this card can win the game. Uh, it's just been out, as you can see, since the beginning of January when we got this for the December card. Uh, and I have lost to it exactly one time. It just hasn't been good any other time I've ever seen it except for that one time because the card is so fragile. I'm still giving it a D, but uh, you know, even if it's only good 10% of the time, that last 10% feels really bad. 
Uh, Pit Lion. This card is actually pretty good in token decks. I'm gonna give it a C though because, again, it's not even the most consistent 3-drop in those decks. It's just really hard to deal with when your opponent goes something like Scouting Patrol or Marked Man into Ring a Pit Lion. Because a 5-5 five, five on turn 2 is pretty obnoxious, it's bigger than all the other 2-drops in the game, so it's really hard to contest, and if you ring it out, of course, it's 5-5 five, five on turn 2. Uh, Pit Lion, though, in any other deck, it's just too inconsistent, so I wouldn't worry about it. If you really want to play Token Spell Sword, there are more important epics to get your hands on, and for 3-drops, there's no shortage of good 3-drops in those kinds of decks, so I wouldn't worry about Pit Lion, but it is kind of cute in those different styles of token decks. Tower Alchemist is a 2-drop, is a 3-drop 2-4, excuse me, it's not a 2-drop. If it were a 2-drop 2-4, it would be good. A 3-drop 2-4 with this ability is not good. Somehow only have two of them, don't care, not very good at all. Just a vanilla that you sometimes pick in Arena. Alpha Wolf, I want to say it's better than it is, I actually do have a premium. Uh, as of right now, the, the Wolf spread is very, very low and very, very bad. You don't see really any of them in Constructed, and therefore you don't see Alpha Wolf. You're definitely not wanting to play this card by itself. If we get better wolves, it'll be better. As of right now, it's pretty awful. But hopefully we see more wolf support. There's a lot of races in this game that could use some more support in the future. Doggy Rot, I'm going to give a C-. minus. You don't need this card in any deck. Potentially in a token deck or a pilfer deck, you can use it to search out your Divine Fervors, your Munda Stone, your Thieves' Den. Um, you can even use it in a control spell sword if you really want to attack your opponent, search out his Grove or something, which we'll talk about in part 2. Uh, but the card in general, it used to be a 4-4 four four, and then it was unplayably bad, now it's just kind of slow. It's still slow. That's the problem. You don't really want this card in an aggressive deck, even if your game plan really centers around a support. It would have to be critically important. Uh, you could play this card in a Rothgar Forge deck, but then you're searching out cards that aren't really that good. I'll give it a C-, minus because if you really want to focus your deck around a support, it's a really good card. But the issue is those decks just aren't too great. Divine Fervor is one of the better supports in the game, however. This card would have been on my A tier list if it was still a 4 cost. It is unfortunately not a 4 cost anymore. That said, it's still powerful in a deck centered around tokens. Uh, it's just that much slower, which makes those decks that much worse, and it's still weak to the same cards like Shadow and Priest that it always has been weak to. The effect, though, is very powerful. It's consistently good. Uh, and, and you do see this card a good bit, not so much in decks like Token Spell Sword, surprisingly. But you see this card in like really slow control mage decks that are filled with prophecies because then you have a really creature heavy list of control mage and you're getting a bunch of free creatures and that makes it really hard for your opponent to deal with all the creatures, all the prophecies. Divine Fervor can add a bunch of stats to your board over a long period of time and those decks want to go long so it makes a lot of sense. So you'll see the prophecies being used to really function against the aggro and the mid-range decks and the Divine Fervor then can really take advantage of that in the late game if you need a bunch of stats on the board to eventually close against those slower decks. So I will give Divine Fervor a B. It's still pretty good. Uh, Hero of Anvil, I'm going to give it a D. I've seen this card exactly once in a token-based deck, and it can be good in the exact right situation, but I don't think this is ever the optimal thing to play in the 5-cost slot. Uh, so you really don't need to worry about this card, no matter what deck you're playing. If you need a filler card in a token deck because you're missing other cards, maybe it's fine. But besides that, not very good. Imperial Might, there have been some grindy token strategies in the past that want to take advantage of Necromancer's Amulet. This card just isn't very good. It's too slow, it doesn't impact the board enough. The value over the long term is not the same as the value of a Divine Fervor, because it's really only good in conjunction with those other slow cards, which just makes your strategy pretty slow and clunky. House Carl, uh, on the surface, is a fine card. The issue it has is space. While it is a fine card, it's not a particularly standout card, so you don't really see this card in any deck except for the one I just mentioned, which is the Prophecy Heavy Control Mage. You will see this card in that deck, it is one of the better prophecies, and since you're overloading on prophecies, you don't need to include just the best ones. House Carl is pretty fine. It's not amazing, but it is fine in that kind of specific deck. In a more aggressive deck, it might seem fine, but it's often just going to be a little bit lackluster. You wouldn't be surprised to see this card in any willpower deck, you just really don't want to worry about including it. It's usually not worth the space in an optimal list. Pillaging Tribune, I did decide not to mention in the A tier list, but it's really close. I'm going to give it a B plus. The issue is that more heal is being released, and uh, with the new heal, such as Knight of the Hour and the new Monk, uh, monthly card. Pillaging Tribune just doesn't always seem like the most optimal version. The the the, tr the drain decks or the the decks that need a healing effect that want to attack a bit earlier, like uh, they want Dawnstar Healer. And the decks that want to go really really long want to maybe use Knight of the Hour or the new Pilfer, the new excuse me, the new Monk card, Protector of the Main. And Pillaging Tribune sort of fits this weird. Uh, slot in a control deck where it's not healing immediately, 
It can heal for a ton immediately if you have something large on the board, but in that way it does sort of require setup. You need to have a deck. First of all, it has creatures that are large enough for it to really matter. Uh, second of all, you need to be in a situation where the attack is good. You have a good face attack that doesn't really give your opponent too many options, or you have a good creature attack. Uh, playing Pillaging Tribune by itself, it's a reasonable body, but it's not getting the job of the drain done. So if you need the drain, playing this card by itself is just not very good. Your opponent can simply ignore it, and it does, it's not super durable by itself. Uh, it's, it's not bad though. It's really not bad. It's better than most of the epics I'm talking about. I'm just listing the ways that it's seeing less play than it has before, but it's still reasonable enough. In a certain deck, it's good. This, most of these decks want to diversify their heals as of right now. And the last few we talk about, Spite Folder More. It's a card that looks better than it is when I first got in the game. I thought it would be good. The effect is just a bit inconsistent, and the problem with the card really is that Execute exists, and you never really want to play four Executes in a deck, especially when one of them costs five and has a body that's not too impressive. Uh, unfortunately, pretty good in Arena, but not very good in Constructed. Don't worry about this card, really. Uh, Immolating Blast, I wouldn't worry about getting three of them as I have right now. I don't really think any deck wants three, but as a one of tech in certain control decks, it has seen a fair bit of play. So I'll give this card a solid, I'll give it a C plus. You don't need it in any control deck, but you'll frequently see it as a pretty easy way to clear boards uh, before Dawn's Wrath and Mana Chorus start coming online. Uh, it's really not bad, better against some decks that go wide than others, obviously. It's a card that if your opponent forgets to play around it, it feels really bad. Uh, I also wouldn't really worry about this card in any deck that has access to Ice Storm, so Control Mage, you probably just want to use Ice Storm as your turn 6 go-to removal for wide boards, but Emulating Blast has seen play before in certain Control Spell Sword decks, for example, that lack those board clears. Emulating Blast, fine card, can be pretty upsetting to lose to when you don't really expect it, and you know that in some decks it's just a one-of, you don't really see three copies of it like I mentioned. And of course, Manticore as the last card in Willpower is a crazy card, so I definitely recommend getting your hands on it. And that's pretty much it for the first three attributes, Strength, Intelligence, and Willpower. Stay tuned for part two, we'll be discussing Agility, Endurance, the class-specific cards, and the neutral cards. If you've enjoyed, as always, feel free to leave a like. I definitely encourage you to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content to see more of it. Deck text, crafting guides, gameplay videos, all that stuff for Elder Scrolls Legends. Follow my stream in the description like I mentioned. Catch me live there, and I'll see you guys next time. Stay tuned for part two, coming up soon.